This lecture is on the historical background behind the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics awarded for quantum information science to Anton Zeilinger of Austria, John Clauser of the USA, and Alan Aspect of France. To set the stage, I want to remind you of the early timeline for quantum mechanics. We all know that Planck proposed the quantum discontinuity in 1900, but it was really in 1905 that Einstein proposed the first particle, quantum particle, the photon. He based his argument on a fairly simple reasoning from statistical mechanics uh, combined with black body radiation uh, theory. And he proposed that, uh, that light actually uh, propagates as, uh, as packets of energy. Now this was actually viewed as a mistake. And, and in fact, when Planck was uh, advancing Einstein for membership in the German uh, physical society, he actually said that he should be elected in spite of this mistake. But in fact, we all know that uh, it was eventually proven to be correct by Millikan in the photoelectric effect, and Einstein, in fact, got the Nobel Prize based on that, rather than actually uh, on his work on the relativity theory. So the first really uh, quantum mechanical model was Bohr's model of 1913, but it, it was ad hoc. And it stayed that way for about a decade when things really started to heat up in 1925, and that was with Heisenberg. And he had done his uh, PhD with Sommerfeld in Munich, then he went to Göttingen, where he became a postdoc with Born, uh, he quickly went up to Copenhagen and then was working as, uh, as Bohr's postdoc, came up with a theory of transition rates when he returned to Göttingen and Born's group that quickly became matrix mechanics. Later that same year, Schrodinger came out with his wave mechanics, and then uh, a year later, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So all this kind of came to a head at the Lake Como conference uh, in Italy, and this is really where Bohr presented the, the basics of the Copenhagen interpretation. And then one month after that was a conference uh, in Brussels, and that was one of the Solvay conferences. So these were extremely um, <clears throat> prestigious conferences, invitation only, to about the uh, 20 top scientists in a given field. And every uh, year it was on a different topic. So in 27 and in 1930, uh, these were on topics of quantum mechanics and and properties of matter. Uh, and so Bohr was there and Einstein was there. And Einstein had been growing increasingly um, uh, disappointed in the direction of quantum mechanics. Um, he did not believe that the randomness was intrinsic, an intrinsic property. He believed that that was actually due to a lack of, of knowledge, that there might be something uh, underlying the fact that a measurement would come out one way or another. And so he would put together these uh, thought experiments and, and pose them to Bohr, and Bohr would initially be stumped, but eventually would figure out uh, where Einstein was wrong, and that quantum mechanics actually did seem to explain everything. And so the guy who captured this, I think, best was Paul Ehrenfest. He wrote this letter about uh, Salve in 1927, and, uh, and he says, Brussels Salve was fine. Bohr, towering over everybody, at first not understood at all, then step by step, defeating everybody. Naturally, once again, the awful Bohr incantation terminology, impossible for anyone else to summarize. Bohr tended to come at his physics uh, with words. And so he would uh, invent words and he would give them precise definitions. And so he would explain why quantum mechanics was actually consistent and, and wave particle duality made sense. That was his complementarity principle. Uh, and so he would, would win these arguments. And they continued in 1930, and Einstein became uh, more and more sophisticated, uh, or his thought experiments became more and more sophisticated to the point where, where Bohr would be stumped and he'd be up half the night, uh, often complaining to Ehrenfest. Um, but by the morning, Bohr would, would see the way out, and, and he would find that uh, what Einstein had posed as a paradox showing an inconsistency in quantum mechanics, Bohr would actually show that it was well within the, the uh, quantum theory. So Einstein never felt that he lost those debate, uh, debates, although that is what the general consensus is, is that Bohr won. Uh, Einstein still felt that there was something missing in quantum mechanics. And so about five years later, he's in, in Princeton at the Institute for Advanced Study, and he's working with Boris Podolsky and uh, Nathan Rosen. And he comes up with a new thought experiment. And this is unlike any that he had posed before uh, to Bohr. And this was because it involved two particles. So the key here was, was, was that there'd be two particles that were part of the same wave function, but they would be separated. And so they could be separated arbitrarily far away from each other, possibly you know, across the universe. Um, 
And so Einstein believed that, that there was local realism, that if you have a particle, you can make measurements on it, and you can measure whatever real uh, properties that particle has, independently of whatever is being done to that particle that's halfway across the universe. And so that's called local realism. And so he thought he came up with a, a good argument, and he gave it to uh, Podolsky to write that up and make more concrete. So Podolsky put it into these terms. And so you consider a particle that decays into two correlated particles, and one goes to one uh, uh, observer, the other one goes to another observer. These are called today Alice and Bob, and that's pretty universal, although back then they didn't use those names. The point was is that Alice makes her measurement, she chooses momentum. Bob makes his measurement, he chooses position. So Alice measures momentum, but because of momentum conservation, she immediately knows what Bob's momentum is. And then the same thing for Bob. As soon as he measures his position, he knows or position of his particle, he knows the position of Alice's particle because of the conservation of center of mass. So Podolsky claims then that delta p is zero, delta x is zero, they're here. So the product delta p delta x is zero. Now this violates the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. And the EPR group, that's Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, or EPR, they accepted the results of quantum mechanics. The uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle was a rigorously derived equation from the principles of quantum mechanics. So this discrepancy was really their statement that quantum mechanics was incomplete. It, it wasn't explaining everything. And there were kind of two ways of resolving this problem. One is that measurement A collapses particle B instantaneously. So that's wave function collapse. And that's really what Einstein rejects. To him, that's spooky action at a distance that violates local realism. Um, so they discount that. Or quantum mechanics con contains some hidden variable that ensures the local realism. And so then this was really the rise of, of hidden variable theories. The, the idea that you could have um, aspects that are hidden to quantum theory that if accessible would explain why the measurements would come out one way or another and that they weren't all just random. And also it would get rid of uh, this instantaneous wave function collapse. So that was published in uh, the Physical Review in 1935, in March of 1935. And, and as soon as Bohr read it, uh, he stopped all the work that was going on at his institute in Copenhagen uh, because he viewed this as an existential threat. He had been working for over 10 years at this point, establishing what uh, would become known as the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. And it looked like uh, EPR had actually come up with a, uh, a fatal blow. Uh, and so Bohr had to figure out uh, how, to, how to refute that. It took him about a month uh, before he realized that, that they had made a mistake, that Podolsky, actually, when he was writing it up by being so specific about momentum and, and uh, position, uh, that there was actually a mistake. Um, and it took him a, another month to write this up and get it, it published. He published with exactly the same title. And this is the exact same title that EPR had used. It's Can Mechanical, Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? And what's funny about this response by Bohr is that there's not a single equation and not a single diagram. It's all just the, uh, the awful Bohr incant incantation um, uh, terminology that's extremely hard to understand, hard to follow, but ultimately is correct. And so this is, this is Bohr's argument. So he, he accepts the conditions set by EPR. So he does not refute any of these statements, including momentum conservation in the center of mass. But what he really simply points out is was that Alice does not know Bob's position or her own position uh, when I, uh, of their particles. Um, and then conversely, Bob uh, does not know what Alice's uh, particle's momentum is, nor his own particle's momentum. And the only way that Bob can know that, or, or both of them can know that, is, is if they share the information. And sharing that information causally connects Alice and Bob. They would have to actually send either a signal or they'd have to travel back and talk to one another. And so that means that in order to build that uncertainty relation that Podolsky had built, uh, it requires non-local information. And so that was actually uh, the flaw. Um, and what's interesting is that, is that Schrodinger also weighed in around this time 
And he was on Einstein's side. He also believed that Heisenberg and Bohr uh, were, were constructing a theory that had absurd consequences. And so he wrote a paper at the end of uh, 1935, which is famous in the history of physics because he introduces the concept of entanglement. He called it Verschränkung, but it's in, uh, translated as entanglement into English. This is also where he introduced his cat, but he viewed it as a uh, burlesque consequence of the theory that Heisenberg and Bohr were, were pushing. And so this idea that you could have a cat that was in a superposition of being alive and dead was, was absurd or burlesque. Um, and so then it, what's interesting too, or ironic, is that entanglement in Schrodinger's cat, which were really raised by Schrodinger in this paper as, as an argument against the Copenhagen interpretation, uh, have now been completely embraced by Copenhagen. So, so we use entanglement and Schrodinger's cat all the time. Not a literal cat, but there are semi-macroscopic uh, systems that can be in, in partial quantum superpositions and things like that. So um, a very uh, thought-provoking paper. The arguments ultimately didn't go forward, but, but the things he invented to, to make his argument actually have gone forward in our, our standard tools now in quantum mechanics. So that's kind of where things stood for uh, uh, until after the war, uh, and then and then on the scene appears David Bohm, and so David Bohm uh, was a professor at Princeton, and he had a a discussion with Einstein about entanglement, and and he was really in the same camp as, as Einstein, but but he had been publishing or writing a book on quantum mechanics, and he had a very deep understanding of what quantum mechanics was really saying. And so as, when he walked away from that, that conversation with Einstein, uh, he actually had an idea for a way of, of combating some of the, of the less palatable aspects of the Copenhagen interpretation. However, uh, he, he hit a snag. He ran into the worst year of his life. Um, he, uh, as a graduate student at Berkeley, had become involved in, in uh, politics, and, and he was interested in communist politics. And in 1951, while it wasn't illegal to be a communist, it was viewed by a large uh, segment of, um, of the public and Congress that if you were a con communist, that you were de facto a spy for Russia. And that was illegal. So he was actually arrested for un-American activities and fired from Princeton. And although he was acquitted of the charges, he was worried about ending up again in, in jail. So he actually fled to Brazil kind of waiting for the, the heat to die down, and then he'd come back, but they took away his passport. So he literally was a political exile from the United States. Um, but he settles down in Brazil and, and pretty quickly publishes two amazing papers in which he develops what's known as Bohmian mechanics. And these, this is a form of quantum mechanics that does not have randomness and does not have wave function collapse and so it gets rid of a lot of the aspects of the Copenhagen interpretation that Einstein didn't like, but he couldn't get rid of non-local character. Um, so, it, so his is a non-local hidden variable, but it is a hidden variable theory, and it's actually a very successful one um, that does successfully explain what is observed in, in quantum mechanical measurements. Um, so after a while, he immigrates to Israel where he meets Aronov. And so Aronov is famous uh, with Bohm for the Aronov-Bohm effect, What's interesting about that is if you look at that closely, it's kind of a hidden variable. It's using the vector potential like a hidden variable explaining a quantum mechanical phase that occurs in closed loops. But prior to that, they also um, re reworked Podolsky's argument, the EPR argument, into a form which could be tested a lot more easily, either experimentally or also theoretically. And so then this is the bohm aronov version of EPR, or it's at least related to it. Um, in this case, you have a source, which might be a single particle that de decays. In this case, I'm just taking as an example two photons. And so it decays into two photons. Uh, the photons can have um, uh, polarization, or they will be polarized. And so you can have a calcite crystal. And so when a single pol uh, photon goes into a calcite crystal, it has to exit either one port or another. So there'll be a vertical port or a horizontal port, and that'll be defined by the uh, relation to the optic axis of the crystal, which can be rotated through this angle theta. Same thing for this crystal over here. Now, this source, let's say if it's in a, 
ground state uh, with no spin, then it might show up with a, uh, a wave function that looks like this. This is an entangled photon pair. One reason it's entangled is because you can't say in, in, independently what state of, of, uh, of one photon is relative to the other. In this case, well, it's, it's a, in a state one, but the second one is state two or state zero. This is state zero, state one. So you can't factor out any of these states. So they are conditionally dependent. If, if you measure a one in the, in the basis and the one zero basis over here, then you are guaranteed to measure a zero over here. So there could be perfect correlations. So in the Copenhagen interpretation, when you then calculate what is the probability of getting two photons exiting the vertical ports here, there are two com contributions. The first is a 50-50, meaning that any photon going into a polarizer uh, has a 50-50 chance of exiting one or the other. And so these are, are left and right circularly polarized photons, okay? And so it has a 50-50 chance of, of exiting as a, as a V or an H. But once one of them has, that then instantaneously collapses the wave function of the other. And so then the second term is just Malu's law. And so this is just Malu's law because the first measurement, which is a 50-50 proposition, then collapses the wave function, which then has perfect correlation, right, through the theta one and the theta two. And so in this form, you could either test uh, actual hidden variable theories, uh, or you could even possibly put this to experiments. So one of the people who picked this up was John Stuart Bell. And, and he has an interesting career as a, as a physicist because he, there were several times when he almost wasn't a physicist. He came from a very poor family in Northern Ireland and uh, you were only guaranteed an education through about the fifth grade, beyond which you would just become a physical laborer. Um, and so uh, he was on his, so his parents couldn't afford to send him to, uh, to high school. And so he was on, on track to becoming a physical laborer uh, for his life. Um, but uh, his family understood how sharp he was. And so they did find a way of getting him enrolled into a trade school where one of his classes was in bricklaying. Uh, he did take some other classes too, and then that allowed him to get a position as a lab tech at Queen's University in Belfast. And so again, that was pretty much it. He was set for life. He was going to be a lab tech. But his professors were impressed by him, and they worked to get him a scholarship, so he actually attended Queen's University then as a student, and he got a bachelor's degree in physics. So he didn't have enough money to go to grad school. And so he enters the civil service and lo and behold, they assign him to CERN. And so he becomes an accelerator designer at CERN, uh, working in the, civil, in the uh, in British uh, civil service of all things. Um, once again, the, the professors are impressed and they uh, get him enrolled at the University of Birmingham where he gets his PhD on CPT violation. In fact, he was one of the very early people working on CPT violation. And so then he goes back to CERN now as a full card carrying uh, physicist doing theoretical physics. And then in 1963, he takes a sabbatical to Slack. Now this actually gives him time to think back of, of an incident that happened in the hallway back when he was at Queens University. And so he was taking quantum mechanics from one of these professors who had actually gotten him the scholarship to attend as a student. And the professor was going on and on about the Copenhagen interpretation. And Bell kept asking him why, you know, how did he know? How did he know? Or how did anyone know that that's what was really happening? And the professor got flummoxed and started to shout. And so Bell started to shout. And so here's this undergrad shouting, having a shouting match with the university professor. In fact, the guy who had sponsored him to get his scholarship. Uh, and they were shouting at each other in the hallway because they were so adamant about, uh, about you know, where the truth lay in, in what did quantum mechanics really mean. So they both felt embarrassed by this. Um, and years later, Bell has a chance to really sit down and figure out once and for all what's really going on uh, in terms of uh, these hidden variable theories in quantum mechanics. And he works it through and he comes up with what's now known as the Bell inequality or the Bell inequalities um, that have to be satisfied if you have hidden variable theories. And he publishes that in a very obscure journal and almost no one notices but some people do, and that's really the rest of the story, and that's what leads to the Nobel Prize. Now, before I get to, to them, let's actually step through Bell's argument. Uh, this is a boiled down version 
Bell's argument is more sophisticated and more general, uh, but this is, is one way of understanding what his, his, his uh, uh, inequalities are, are trying to say. So in this case, you have a source, which is putting out two photons, <clears throat> but, and you also have these calcite analyzers with uh, angles theta one, theta two, but there's a hidden variable that gets interposed in between, and that's this theta three. And so you have to figure out what are the probabilities of detecting the photon coming out of these various ports, in, including these, these hidden ports as well. And so for instance, you can construct the probability for V1 and H2, and it's going to be uh, the probability uh, that you have V1H2, V1H2, but, but coming through V3 or H3. And so that's V3 or H3 here. That exhausts the possibility. It's only binary. There's only two ways it can do that. And so this completes the probability. Now, so, this, so that's this. This is just that term. But you can actually get rid of this, take that away, and you now have an inequality. So here's an inequality. Here's one. You can do the same thing down here. P for V2H3 is then P V1 or H1. And so those are the two options coming out here. And the rest is just V2H3, V2H3. Again, you can get rid of the, um, you get rid of the, uh, I guess must be this term here. And so then this has to be greater than that. And so here's a second inequality. Well, you can just add those together. And so you get that PV1H2 plus PV2H3 has to be greater than the sum on this side. But if you look there, you can trace over uh, the second variable, okay? Because here's H2 and here's V2. And, and, on, and on either side, then you have V1H3, V1H3. So that means that this is PV1H3. So now you actually have one of Bell's inequalities. It's PV1H2 plus PV2H3 has to be greater than or equal to PV1H3. And this is almost as simple as, as agreeing that one plus one equals two. Um, this is local realism. This is saying that um, you exhaust the probabilities for the way that these photons can, can emit from these ports, these H and V ports, and it doesn't matter it, that there's a hidden variable in there, you still have exhausted all the probabilities in this argument. And so this is, is either common sense or it's just how classical probabilities behave uh, or local realism behaves. Uh, and so this is, is Bell's argument. So in the same paper though, we do know how quantum mechanics behaves and we know that it's, it goes as these one half factors and then it goes as Malu's law. So you can plug all these things in for those probabilities. So you can actually calculate what these probabilities are and you plug those in and it's usually positive, but not always. It turns out that there are some select angles where it's negative. Uh, it's not strongly negative, but it is negative. And so it turns out that, that using what's known of quantum mechanics, putting it into Bell's inequalities, you do violate local realism. And so you, you end up um, discounting the possibility of a local hidden variable. Uh, they are all discounted universally. Uh, this was a very general proof. It did not depend on any of the details, actually, of uh, what the hidden variable theories would be. And so this discounted all hidden variable theories, local hidden variable theories. So Bohm's non-local hidden variable theory is actually still alive at this point. So this violates Bell's inequality. It means quantum mechanics uh, does not have a, hidden, a local hidden variable theory. But as this was going by, you might have noticed that, that what to calculate these probabilities, you are looking at, in this case, H3, here's another H3. These are actually inaccessible to experiment. These are part of the hidden variable. And so while Bell can show that quantum mechanics is inconsistent with local realism, therefore it has to be non-local, uh, it this argument involves experimentally inaccessible values. The theoretical conclusion is correct, but it actually could not be tested in this way experimentally. And so then that opens the door to John Clauser. So John Clauser, also an interesting story. Um, so he's at Columbia University. He's a graduate student in astrophysics, but he has to take this quantum mechanics course. And the, and the quantum mechanics course at Columbia was famous. Uh, you had to actually pass it with an A. And if you didn't, you had to take it again. 
And for instance, I, I think that Charles Towns, I think, had to take it three times, at least twice, but maybe three. And I think Clauser was on his third time taking this quantum mechanics course. And so he was becoming con uh, obsessed with quantum mechanics and so was going to the library and looking up obscure papers. And he ran across John Bell's paper and he was really intrigued by it. And he actually thought that um, the fact that there was no experimental way of testing it uh, kept the door open, that maybe Einstein was right. Um, so he begins thinking of stronger inequalities and he comes up with an idea. He actually, you have to do more measurements than, than what uh, uh, Bohm and Aronov had come up with. But, but even so, it was something that would be accessible to experiment. So he submits that as an abstract to an APS meeting. And we've all done that and APS abstracts aren't worth a lot and it's really just some idea that we're gonna try to flesh out. Um, but he gets a phone call uh, a few weeks later by, uh, from Abner Shumany at uh, Boston Uni uh, Shimoni, uh, from Boston University. Turns out that uh, Sh uh, Shimoni or, uh, and his student um, Michael Horn had actually stumbled on Bell's paper too and had also started thinking along the same lines, but they had almost put it in an abstract but hadn't, but Shimoni was on the, uh, the sort of the abstract sorting committee and so he had seen Clausier's abstract. Um, and so rather than competing, he called up to collaborate. And so Clauser's fine with that. He goes up to Boston. Uh, he visits MIT in addition, in addition to uh, Boston University. Also uh, meets Richard Holt, who's at Harvard. And he's repeating an experiment that uh, Eugene Cummins had just completed out at Berkeley. And, uh, and it wasn't on uh, EPR uh, and entanglement, uh, but it was a system that could be adapted to that. So they all started to talk. So C, H, S, and H all started to talk. In the meantime, Clauser graduates with a PhD from Columbia, uh, gets a postdoc position at Berkeley, and then they all working together come up with this, what's called the CHSH inequality, but that's finalized while he's gonna be traveling to Berkeley. It's gonna be finalized, or at least the paper was. And so his plan was to sail down the uh, East Coast, because uh, at that time he was living on a sailboat in the New York Harbor, and so he was going to sail his sailboat uh, around Florida to Galveston, Texas, and then ship it across to uh, Los Angeles and, and then sail up to Berkeley, uh, where he'd, he'd take up his postdoc position. And so as he was going down the coast, uh, he was communicating with his collaborators. And, and, he, and this is a quote from an a, a interview that he had with uh, APS. Uh, so he says, so every time we put into port, I would get on the phone and Abner knew my schedule. And so basically he would send off his redrafts to all the various marinas in the next city where we put in, some of which I picked up and some of which are probably still sitting there now for all I know. And so this would be an interesting time or way to do uh, physics archaeology and see if some of these packages from uh, Abner Shimoni is, are actually still sitting in some of these marinas. So they finalized it as he was uh, sailing south. Um, but instead of getting to Texas, he ran into Hurricane Camille and so he had to uh, zip into port in Florida. Uh, he missed the worst of it, uh, but in fact, Camille was not too uh, different from Ian. And so the kind of damage that, that we see with Camille is actually about the same kind of damage we saw with Ian that just happened last month. So anyway, he ships his boat to Berkeley and he arrives at Berkeley. In the meantime, this is what the CHSH inequality uh, looks like. It's a little more complicated than, uh, than before because now Alice has two measurements. She can make, Bob has two measurements. Each outcome is binary. And so it's either plus one or minus one. And so they had constructed this, um, this quantity. And if you look at it, it's always plus two or minus two. And so if you look at its average, it's always less than or equal uh, to two. It turns out that the average of the sum is equal to the sum of the average. And so you finally have, in this case, the CHSH inequality. So a hidden variable theory would have to satisfy this inequality. But we all know quantum mechanics, so you can plug right in for what the quantum mechanical results would be. And in fact, they're equal to two root two. Uh, and so that's actually greater than two by, by 1.414, so about a 40% violation. So a very large violation. And this is something that can be tested experimentally. So Clauser arrives at Berkeley, and this is one of the only places I know that, that you can uh, see five Nobel Prize winners having their own parking spot right outside the physics building. In fact, so there are five signs there. 
um, in this photo. And this photo was taken just a few years ago. Um, also at Berkeley, oops, also at Berkeley is Eugene Cummins. Uh, he's the one who had finished off that experiment with a graduate student um, that was, was uh, ideal uh, for testing the CHSH uh, inequality, even though Cummins himself had not done that. So Clauser is showing up to be a astrophysics uh, uh, postdoc, but the first thing he does is, is talk to a guy doing atomic and molecular optics and asks if he can use his equipment. Now, of course, uh, Cummins says, what a pointless waste of time <laughs> that all is. Um, he doesn't want any part of it because he knows quantum mechanics works. You don't need to test quantum mechanics one more time. But Clauser was savvy. He talks with Charles Towns, uh, who was a fellow alum from uh, Columbia. And so he gets Towns on board. And so the, in this uh, interview of Clauser with APS, uh, he describes this, this time when Towns walks in, puts his arm around Cummins' shoulders, and says, well, what do you think of this, Gene? It looks like a very interesting experiment to me. And so when Charles Towns says it's an interesting experiment, then it's an interesting experiment. So Cummins loans one of his graduate students to Clauser. Uh, he thinks it's maybe six months and they'll be done. They'll discover nothing new and then everyone can get back to what they're actually paid for. But of course, it takes two years. And so Clauser and Stuart Friedman, so Stuart Friedman is the graduate student who was loaned to this project by uh, Eugene Cummins. Um, and they do, after two years, publish solid results. They actually see a five sigma violation of the CHSH inequality. So this is the first experimental test of a Bell inequality. And so even though, in a way, a lot of people shrugged, and even Cummins kind of shrugged at this, um, it was the first time that anyone had done an experimental test of the uh, Bell inequalities, confirming that quantum mechanics violates those uh, inequalities, and so that, in fact, local hidden variable theories are, are ruled out. And so that is actually a very important statement. Now, part of the story, though, is that uh, Richard Holt at Harvard uh, actually had a head start on this experiment. And so, so Clauser was, was doing catch-up this whole time, and the Harvard group got results first, but they had had some technical difficulties, and it turned out that the Harvard results actually uh, agreed with the inequality. So the Berkeley and the Harvard groups got competing results. The Harvard group never published. Their, their work was, was known by the community because they presented it at some uh, workshops, but they never had enough confidence to actually publish it, uh, whereas Friedman and Clauser did. And Friedman actually went on to become a professor uh, at Berkeley. Clauser eventually got back to doing some astrophysics after this. But, uh, but he actually stayed, even after this, this paper, he actually did a, a little bit more work on this, again confirming that there's a violation of the CHSH inequalities. But this did open the door uh, to Allen Aspect. And so, so there was this discrepancy between the published Berkeley results and the unpublished Harvard results. Um, but that wasn't the main thing. The main loophole that was still open from the Clauser experiments was the fact that that Clauser used static polarizers and also the size of the experiment was not large and so there was a potential causal connection between the detectors in his in his system so they were not um, they were not space like separated in space-time which means that there could be some kind of a causal back action of one detector on another right and so that could could cause correlations so Alan Aspect got his PhD in 71 from the Ecole Supérieure d'Optique. And so then you have to do a, a habilitation. And, and he read Bell's paper in 1973. And so he decided that, that, and also the Clauser paper. And so he decided that this was what he wanted to do for his habilitation. But he wanted to close that loophole on the uh, causal influence that could possibly have been there in the experiment. And so he was going to do it with, with photons where you choose your polarization on the fly while the photons are actually in flight. So first of all, he has an advantage because now lasers have become common tools in the laboratory. And with uh, Friedman and Clauser, they were using incandescent sources uh, or arc source sources. Uh, but with lasers, you could get much higher photon fluxes. So they had a two photon transition in calcium. It's the same calcium decay that, that um, uh, Holt had used it at Harvard and that Clauser and Friedman had used at Berkeley, uh, but now it's being pumped with two lasers. And so it's a two photon uh, transition up to the excited state. It decays away into two entangled photons, 
And then aspects show that this had a 10 sigma violation of the Bell inequalities. And so it's a big improvement on the Clauser uh, accuracies. Uh, but then he then took that next step. And by putting in an acousto-optic modulator that could be switched very rapidly between these two arms and then between these two arms, and then these polarizations are set differently, that he could choose his polarization while the photons were in flight. And he also had this length L large enough so that these PMTs were not causally connected. So they were, they were space-like, they had a space-like interval in their space-time diagram. And so under these conditions where there was no, could be no causal influence uh, between the detections and the fact that the polarizations were selected on the fly, uh, he saw then a five sigma violation of Bell's inequalities. So again, showing that quantum mechanics um, violated local realism. And so then this is really the definitive non-local demonstration uh, of the inequalities. But there are still loopholes, and so people continued to work, and one of these was Anton Zeilinger. He got his PhD from the University of Vienna, uh, working on neutron polarization, and in 76 he attended a symposium on entanglement, and he also read Bell's paper, uh, became very interested, but neutrons were not a great way of doing those kinds of experiments. Uh, so he really started a, a, a complete transformation uh, becoming a, a quantum optics um, uh, experimentalist. And so he put together a laboratory uh, that was pursuing uh, aspects of, of entanglement and uh, quantum non-locality. And in 89, a group of three of them, and it was Green, uh, Greenberger uh, Horn, and that's the same Michael Horn of the CHSH inequality, and then Zeilinger, the Z, they came up with a three-particle entanglement, a GH, which is called the GHZ state. Um, and so then this actually goes a step further because while the Clauser and Aspect experiments, they had their violation that only came out after averaging over large ensembles, it turned out that this three-particle uh, entanglement state, you could actually get classical violations with a single measurement. And so you did not require the, the ensemble measurements. And so the, the way that they envisioned this is that you'd have a source of a three-particle entanglement, and then you could put it through beam splitters and, and, um, and uh, polarizers, and you'd have your output ports where you could do your detections. And this is an example of this three-particle um, entangled state, 000 plus 111. But what they were able to show was that if you have two rectilinear polarizations set, and then another one is set as diagonal. And so this, this could be H or V, and then this will be D plus or D minus for plus 45 or minus 45 degree polarization. That if these two come out horizontal, that the quantum mechanics says that this comes out D plus, a local realist classical theory would actually say that this would be D minus. And so it turned out that the quantum mechanical result and the classical result were exactly opposite of each other. And so if you did just a single measurement and a single photon popped out of the D-plus port in this case, you actually had a violation of classical physics or local realism. And it, and it wasn't just this. It actually happened for a lot of these, these possibilities here. And, and then there are other possibilities on top of these. And so it turned out that you could actually be testing local realism uh, with single photon detection in this case. And you weren't actually just averaging over ensembles. So he began developing the technological resources to develop this state. It actually was not trivial and involved a lot of technology, and they invented some unique light sources along the way uh, that were, made it really easy to work with entangled uh, pairs on, on uh, optical tables. But in the meantime, uh, in 1993, uh, something interesting happened. So Bennett, Charles Bennett and Gilles Brassard actually met floating in the Caribbean Ocean off of Puerto Rico. And by the time they had swum to shore, they had invented the first quantum cryptography protocol. Uh, and then a few years later, they came out with this, a quantum teleportation protocol. And it, it's a way of using a classical channel to communicate quantum information. And that's why they eventually called it uh, teleportation. So what that is, is you have a classical channel, but you do share a quantum resource. And so this is an entangled pair. And the way that this could work is that Alice and Bob, they, they each take half of one of these pairs and they store them. They then go to separate locations. Alice now has an unknown state, and it's in a quantum superposition. She's not allowed to do any measurements to tell what alpha and beta are, so she just has this unknown state. They also share this quantum resource, which is this entangled pair. Uh, 
What Alice can do is she can actually do a joint measurement of some joint property between psi1 and psi2 and get a classical result that she can send to Bob through a classical channel. Bob then, with this piece of classical information, can do a unitary operator on his half of the entangled pair and out will pop out the unknown state. And, and so they never looked at it, they don't know what it is, but using a classical channel, they've actually regenerated it over here. And so that's the quantum teleportation protocol. So Zeilinger realized that all the optical equipment sitting on his table that he was working on to approach the GHZ state um, could actually be used for this. And so his lab quickly pivoted and they did actually the first quantum teleportation experiment. <clears throat> So I'm going to walk through this a, a little bit briefly. It's, it's a truncated form of the uh, bennett brassard protocol, but you have a UV pulse coming into a, a parametric down conversion crystal, so you have a single photon splitting into two that go off this way. That's the quantum resource. The same pulse, which actually has a long pulse length, and so then this little delay here doesn't matter. The same pulse comes back, and it generates an unknown state that you can prepare with this polarizer, but also sends off a herald. This just tells you that, yeah, there's a photon coming. And so once you know the photon's coming, Alice now can do a joint measurement, and they, she gets classical information on these two channels. In principle, she could send that to Bob, who could then operate on his, now his particles. Now, these are all photons in flight. So this is teleportation, known as teleportation after the fact. So it turns out that, that one quarter of the time, Alice will get an appropriate measurement, and then Bob has this beam splitter set up in a certain way that when Alice one time out of four gets a certain measurement, it means that, that her state had been teleported, had already been teleported. Now, three times out of four, you, know, you just get junk. Um, but one time out of four, you're getting a teleportation. Uh, and again, you know it after the fact. You didn't do anything actively to do the, to teleport it, uh, but you know that it was successful after the fact just by analyzing D3 and D4 relative to what you what you measure with D1 and D2. And so, in fact, it was a experimental confirmation of the uh, of the Bennett protocol for teleportation. In fact, a lot of people thought that uh, Zeilinger might get the Nobel Prize actually for this for quantum teleportation, uh, and that quantum teleportation was open for a Nobel Prize. And so maybe. Uh, it would have been Bennett and Brassard and Zeilinger might have shared a Nobel Prize for that. Um, but there was another competing group uh, between the UK and, and Italy who had also done some form of teleportation and had actually done it a little bit earlier than Zeilinger. And so that kind of muddied the water on uh, who had actually done teleportation first. It was a different type of teleportation and it didn't use the Bennett protocol, um, but that raised a lot of arguments and, and questions about, you know, was that uh, pure teleportation or not? But in fact, Shortly after this, uh, Zeilinger got back to his GHZ state, was able to confirm the non-classical behavior uh, using uh, single measurements without needing to do ensembles. And so then that then finally closed off uh, the need to do ensemble measurements uh, for the Bell inequalities. And so then that, that sort of finished off the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics, which is really given for entanglement and the Bell inequalities. And so John Clauser did the first experiments Alan Aspect, he really demonstrated the non-locality that was left open by the first experiment. And then Zeilinger then finished this off with uh, ways of doing the measurements uh, without even requiring ensemble sums. And so then that is the backstory of the uh, 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. And for further reading, uh, this is all part of uh, a chapter in my upcoming book, Interference, The History of Interferometry and the Scientists Who Tamed Light. It's uh, coming out from Oxford University Press in the spring of 2023. Thank you.